Hi, I'm Tracy Kutchker. I'm Director Curator at Salmon Arm Art Center, and I am so very pleased to be joined today by Louis Thomas, Councillor of Nisconleth Band, and an incredibly wonderful friend of mine. Hi, Louis. Hi. <laughs> yeah, ciao, Louis Thomas. Uh, born and raised in Salmon Arm here, and long time resident, 74, going on 74 years now. Great. Why don't you give us a traditional welcome? Yeah. Hey, yeah. Kaso is yam squata siyana yatamil. Kichas yam kalkupi is a yokamina tayana. As a pecha, a lucas yam pochai. What I said was, uh, our people traveled in this land, hunt and gather. And the Creator put us here to look after the land. And we traveled always maybe up to the Alberta, Alberta border, up in that area, maybe as far south as uh, Washington, and uh, maybe the Fraser, as far as I know, the Fraser. And uh, so our people have been here for generations. Amazing. So Louis, you and I got to know each other more during the Trail Mix project and exhibition, which was in 2015 and 16. I was so amazed by the incredible uh, wealth of stories that you're able to share and the knowledge that you are so generous with, um, with the settler culture. And the more I learn about you and your mother, the more I realize that that has been the most incredible gift uh, to a uh, cross-cultural understanding between the settler and indigenous cultures here. And so, yeah, I just, I truly want to thank you for being that bridge for our communities. Well, I think I've been talking about this for quite a number of years now, you know. Uh, we talk about truth and reconciliation. I think I've been doing that for the last 40 years now. And uh, just, I think it's getting a better, under letting the people have a better understanding who we are as the Watma. And uh, I think that's uh, what uh, we're, me and my mother were really about. We worked together as a really good team. When she passed away, I kind of dropped from sight for a while and now I'm back again and doing the same thing as usual again. But uh, you know, she was, between the two of us, you know, we, we really had a real clicking team. Mm -hmm. And she's really missed. Absolutely. So one of the things that we worked on, we've worked on a couple of projects together already that, that have been fantastic. Uh, but one of the things we worked on was a seat at the table and the traditional Sahuatmic feast that we had within that exhibition. And that is because you have been working for many decades now about, uh, about issues around food security and traditional foods and traditional harvesting techniques. And so that's what I'd like to talk to you about today is the efforts that you've been working on to reintroduce all of that knowledge into your community and, and helping the wider world discover that as well. So one of the things we learned during Seat at the Table was that there's a number of traditional foods that we, like the settler culture, knows nothing about, all available in the Sahuatmic territory, like the supalali, for instance. Which is, which is a berry that it actually is, and how does that how does that work? Was it the the word spitzmalf means supalali? Yeah, it's the bush itself. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah. And that was indicative of the meeting place. That was. Oh, yeah, the meeting place to start gathering the supalali. Apparently, it was just uh, the whole valley here was just covered with supalali and um, that's where a lot of the people came to pick it. And what they did was they dried it for winter use. So a lot of our foods were all dried. And, uh, 
and uh, that was the way it was done for centuries. And now we now it's all disappearing. I think you'll find very few bushes around here. Well, just the coming of uh, the settlers and taking it over as farmland and logging, uh, you name it. It, uh, it, uh, the soup lally has disappeared. In fact, all our berries are disappearing. All our uh, crops are disappearing. Nobody's really looked at it. <clears throat> My mother got into plants and I got into the construction of the uh, of our way of life. I've done the pit house, smoke house, anything that had to do with outside, but they, they concentrate more on the plants. And, uh, and it was a, I didn't pay too much attention to it because I was busy learning how to reconstruct a lot of the traditional ways. So, but I did go on a bunch of field trips with them, help them harvest a few berries. And, you know, we always talked about the disappearance of them. And I've been after Minister of Agriculture for years to help us with it, to, re, to get it, to reintroduce it back to, to our people again. They told me it was wild crafting. <laughs> they didn't know anything, really didn't know anything about it. So it was out of their belly, what they said. So, but uh, somebody finally heard and now we're working with uh, Ag Canada and uh, we got a small project to do some testing and see if we can really bring back our traditional ways of harvesting. And I think that's really important because it is uh, part of our culture and uh, a lot of it is a culture because we're dealing with, uh, with the land itself. And uh, you know, it's, uh, and I think it's important to a lot of people, you know, because it's that reconnection with the land that's important. You know, we're out there harvesting what Mother, Mother Nature gave to us. You know, the Al Kupi gave us. We go out there and we, out there weeks harvesting and we're reconnecting with the land again. And uh, to get a better understanding, you know, and I think uh, all cultures were at one time were connected to the land mm -hmm. and we somehow lost it. You know, so it, uh, <clears throat> it's an ongoing thing, you know, and. and I kind of took it over because my, my mother talked about it a lot of times, you know, the disappearance of our plants and how do we get it back, you know, because we've lost the ways. Because when they start putting us on these little reserves, we couldn't go out and hunt and gather anymore. So that made it even more difficult. And uh, they made us hunt and gather at uh, Walmart, uh, Safeway, and... <laughs> Because I keep telling people, you know, that that's the only way we hunt and gather now. And uh, so it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's high time that we did go back and start discovering our way, especially with this uh, new COVID, you know, and they talk about food security. And, mm -hmm. But uh, I think to me, it's, uh, it's, it's more about uh, the culture itself. When we start eating our plants again and eating, and I think we'll be really eating our culture is what I keep telling people, you know. And I think, I believe we call our project Eating Our Culture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of the things that was so great about the feast was being able to try some of the traditional foods uh, that have been harvested, you know, for thousands of years in this area. Um, things like the wapato and the avalanche lily and the spring beauty. But I know that those things are very rare and when you go out to harvest them the bounty is very small and so is that because the condition of the land uh, has changed like it's just been impacted by ranching or logging why are those foods not able to um, reproduce themselves in the forest anymore well yeah i think it's because of the uh you don't know, we kind of blamed the car, the cattle and everything else, you know, and they put us on these little reserves. We couldn't go out and hunt and gather like we did before. They made us more reliant on the local grocery store. So our people have lost that uh, ability to go out and till the soil, so to speak, so they, so they can keep, uh, keep them going the traditional way. 
And uh, to me, that's uh, part of it, you know. Uh, it, uh, I guess it would be because that uh, the ground is getting harder and harder and it's making them a lot harder to grow. And uh, we, me and my, well, that's where I got the, that's why I'm involved in this project because uh, my mother was talking about, my grandmother talked about, we took, we went out and tried harvesting. And the ground was so hard, you know, we, we couldn't even, you know, they complained because, you know, all through the centuries, all they need was a wooden digging stick to dig them up. Now we need a pick and shovel to dig them up. <clears throat> so that tells you how incredibly hard that the soil is. Because if our people were out there, you know, uh, they had to feed uh, their bands, uh, 100 people, maybe two, 300 people all winter long and they had to dry enough uh, food for them all winter so you could imagine how much they had to store for the winter so now we tried it i think it would uh, last the food we're lucky we can get one meal yeah well you've seen the meal we had you know we just had enough to cover what is it 40 people mm -hmm. and uh you know and that took a couple of days to harvest that was a, so it's not uh, an easy thing anymore. Mm -hmm. But you know, uh, what I'd like to see is how do we reintroduce it back to our people so they're back to eating their culture. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, a lot of uh, other people would, would love it because you know, it's uh, how organic can you get, you know, and it's something that Mother Nature gave, uh, gave to us. That's the part I think that, uh, you know, I think that a lot of people would really, really like because uh, my girl is working for Cotans and they eat uh, the same things that we do, and, uh, you know, which is surprising. And they're from Japan. Yeah. So it's not new, but, you know, I think uh, what we got to do is go back and start really looking at a, a system where we can reintroduce it back to our people and and anyone else who's interested in trying it. So are you in communication with other um, indigenous groups in the BC interior to see if there's some foods that maybe did thrive in other areas and can be back, brought back and reintroduced into the shoe swap or the other way around? Well, we did with the Wapato. It just totally disappeared from here and, and Garibaldi from Uvic brought uh, some over and they're, they're thriving now. Oh, so, and Wapato, you know, Wapato grow ahead. on the lake side, on the lake shore, right? Yeah, yeah, they, uh, they harvested in, uh, in the fall time. And uh, the ones that we have down there now, the, the canary grass is so thick in there, the, the root system is about four inches deep in there. And my grandmother used to just use her toes to dig them out from the bottom of the lake or the, you know, the bay. Yeah. She just used her toes and the potato would pop up. And now we have to still have to use a shovel again to dig them up. So we'd have to look for another system and, uh, and uh, I'll have to work on it. And uh, I've talked to a, a few other people from different bands and uh, there are there is a, a little bit of interest of reintroducing back some of our potato crops again so it it's coming I think mm -hmm. you know and I think it's about time that uh, our people started going back to their culture and you know getting out in the land and start harvesting the traditional way they do it with huckleberries and blueberries and all the good tasting crops. But now I see a big change going towards medicinal plant. Yeah. Got more and more people going out for medicinal plants. So to me, I think it's more like the healing that we're going through. And uh, that's why I think that people are looking at the medicinal plants. So, because we've come a long ways in the last 30, 40 years now. And I think that the changes are coming and uh, I think I still think that we should be really looking at the, all our plants. So it's much more than just the food supply. It's about your relationship with the land and all the things that grow on the land around you. Yeah. 
because you know uh, <clears throat> all our chiptacula with the you know you 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 listen to a lot of our chiptacula they talk about a lot of famine you know people going hungry so they must have been a lot of it back then because there's a lot of reference to it you know, and then, because a lot of them say, if you keep taking and taking and giving nothing back in return, you will suffer for it. That's what we've been telling the forestry for, since we started meeting on Mount Ida, the legend of Mount Ida. And uh, if you keep taking and taking, you're gonna eventually, famine is eventually gonna fo follow. And uh, you, when you look at it now, you know, there's no more fiber. The people are out of work, so naturally they're going to be getting hungry. And I think this is what our Chiptakola talk about, our legend talk about, is that famine is going to follow. Then it has that domino effect, you know, if they're not working, so the stores don't get enough money to help support the community. You know, it's like the domino effect, you know, where nobody, everybody's out of work and Mm -hmm. There's really literally no money coming in, and uh, and that's when the government has to step in. So mm. it's a, a long haul, and uh, I keep talking about, it, but nobody listens because you know it's traditional knowledge. And I think that there are some things that our people experience, you know, and uh, they put it into a chiptekul or a legend as a teaching to the people that are uh, in the you know the people that come they talk about us you know because uh, these stories were told through the century now I'm, I'm starting to understand why they told us that it was that oral history that was passed on and we have to learn from them you know we got to read between the lines what are they really saying to understand what message they're giving and each and every Chiptekula has a message to give to our people. Mm -hmm. So it's good that you bring up the oral history because of course with the legacy of residential schools and the 60s scoop and all of the horrific atrocities that were committed against Indigenous peoples in Canada, there's been a break in the line with the oral history and the knowledge that you're trying to access to help pass down to the next generation. So how do you rediscover that knowledge and, and be able to teach it to a generation that has this collective trauma? Well, I grew up with more or less with my grandmother and uh, the family moved out the reserve and they went out working off reserve and I stayed, well, I was in and out of trouble in my younger years and uh, um, not ashamed to admit it, you know, I grew up a little bit wild when I was younger. And, uh, but I had no place else to go, so I stayed with my grandmother. And to me, it was a blessing. Mm -hmm. You know, she always spoke to what around me, her and her sister. They spoke to what all the time, and they were, I guess they were teaching me. Even when I was younger, I stayed with them, because in our culture, you know, the eldest son was given to the grandparent. Hmm. My brother Harold, he was a older than I was, he was given to my dad's side of the family. And they kept him and raised him as our own. But on my mother's side, they gave me over to her parents. But they were a little more compassionate. They let me go back and forth, but they all just came and picked me up. So I think they were telling me, teaching me things when I was growing up. Because a lot of things now I seem to know instinctively. Mm -hmm. And uh, without questioning it. And uh, the, so this was the way of our people a long time ago. You know, now we have a tendency to kind of ignore our elders now. And uh, it's, uh, my grandmother, you know, uh, must have taught me a lot of things, you know. She taught me how to smoke salmon was one of them. <laughs> and the language. I didn't realize I could speak a little bit of the language until about 10, 15 years ago. All of a sudden I start putting words together and, uh, and start making complete sentences. And sometimes I'd be driving along or without even thinking, all of a sudden the words would start popping in my head. 
I tell people I must have been a good boy because, uh, you know, I must have listened to her. <laughs> but no, it, uh, it, one of the, I keep telling people, you know what, the language is in you. All it's going to take is a spark to get, to get back to speaking it again. So I think it's very deep in you. Mm-hmm. And because uh, I think you, like my grandmother just spoke and I didn't really know what you talk. She didn't sit me down at a table and say, well, here's how you learn your language. We went out in the fields, we went all over and she just spoke this Wapmuk language. And that's the way I learned, I guess, because uh, I can't see any other way of how I learned it. <clears throat> and maybe that's why I couldn't really speak it for a while because, uh, you know, I had nobody to talk to because uh, everybody was speaking English around me. Mm-hmm. So that was one of the, I think, of the blessings of my grandmother. I got really her to thank for because it gives me, I think it gives me uh, a sense of kind of pride in who I am, you know, as a Suwapu person. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not only just speaking the language, but, you know, it's understanding who we are as people. And I think without that knowledge, I think I'd have been probably like everybody else. I'd have been probably long gone by now because all the people I grew up with, they're all passed away, you know, in drinking and and all of that. Mm-hmm. But I think it, it gives me a foundation of being a... being a... Kalmuk. Uh, <laughs> it's Swapma. <laughs> you know, and uh, to me, it uh, and I enjoy talking to people. Sometimes I'd sit in a coffee shop and people have a real interest in it. Now, these are the kind of people I like talking to because a lot of things start clicking in when you talk about it. You know, you get a, bit, a better sense of why our people are here and how they survived. And it, uh, it really kicks in because a lot of times I'd have coffee with a few people in town here and we'd sit there for hours just talking and uh, about our culture basically. Because there's a lot of people who want to understand what is it to be Sawatma? Mm-hmm. What is it to be Kalmu? Because when you really think about it, you know what? You know, they talk about Canada as a, as a native place. When you really think about it, you know, right from the tip of North America to the tip of South America, it's all Kalmukulu. It's all Indian land, because we were here for centuries. Mm-hmm. You, you come in at night, why, you know, looking after the land. And to me, I think that's what we got to get back to, is Kalmukulu, you know. In one of my speeches, I too, I talked about uh, Kanakulu. <laughs> Get the Canucks back. <laughs> Land of the Canucks. <laughs> but yeah, you know, uh, to me, it's, uh, I think it, uh, the more we get into eating our plants, and I think that more of our culture will start coming back. I, I really believe in that, you know. Mm-hmm. Because you're eating part of what what was given to you. Once you start eating more of that, I think uh, a lot of our culture is going to come back, and uh, uh, that's what I believe anyway. <laughs> I think a lot of people don't really because we've lost so much of our culture now that people don't fully understand, especially the other societies. You know, they lost the connection with the land a long time ago. They don't have that connection anymore. I keep telling people, you got to get out to the land, walk, walk the trails, walk the roads, or some, be more aware of what's growing. The plants will talk to you. The water will talk to you. They'll tell you stories. The trees will talk to you. Everything will talk to you. But you got to learn to speak their language too, just like we had to learn the English language. Mm-hmm. You know, so in order to tell our story, so if you listen to the trees, they'll tell you a story of how they were bountiful at one time, or they owned the land. (laughs) Good (laughs) job.
You once uh, told me about, you were explaining how difficult it is for a little baby and a small child to grow up in an orphanage without its mother and without a family or a community to support it and then compared it to trees being grown in a nursery, basically like a tree orphanage. Yeah. So, yeah. So tell us more about that, about the idea of the forest, um, like the health of the forest needing well, it. In our culture, they're personified. They're living beings like us. Everything is a living being. And uh, when you really think about it, <clears throat> you know, the, the trees are like us. They'll drop the seed and the mother will watch it, watch it grow into a big, healthy, strong tree. And if it's weak and everything, it'll die out but the mother will always be there to look after, to protect it, to make it grow into a big healthy tree. Now you take that seed and you put it, put it into a nursery without the love of the mother. That tree is gonna be more like susceptible to diseases. That's why I keep telling people, you know, that uh, that's why I see a lot of pine was planted because when I was tree planting, I was even a tree planter too growing up. And all we planted was pine. And these were the ones from the nursery. So when you think of it, you know, humans, you know, when they, uh, they lose their young ones and they put them in the orphanage, they're more susceptible to trauma, to diseases, uh, you know, to addiction. They have a tough time growing up. Now, if you put those seeds, same seed of a tree into a, into a, a nursery without the love of the mother, naturally they're gonna be susceptible to diseases and everything. And you th really think about it. And when, uh, when the uh, pine beetle came in, who did they attack? Oh, but probably, you know, they really done the study and maybe they attacked all the nursery trees. You know, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, that's my theory. Mm -hmm. You know, when I think back on our culture and what, what it's about. So uh, this is something I keep telling people, you know, and they kind of say, ah, it's not really true because, uh, you know, we're westernized and our culture, we don't, they don't know nothing. But I think there's a lot of things that we could probably learn from. I agree. <laughs> and then the other thing that was interesting that we talked about one day about gardening and about agriculture and that, and you said, well, when I think about agriculture, I think about peas and carrots and I don't want to be out in the garden weeding between the rows when I could be out in the forest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true, you know, when you look back at history, you know, I was, I was just watching Geronimo the other night, and uh, I think he said that, uh, he said, well, we want you to become farmers, and he said, well, I'm not a farmer, he said, I'm a warrior, you know, I get my food from the land, you know, so they've been trying for centuries to make farmers out of us, and they were unsuccessful, and I think the main reason is because we don't believe in planting, go along and planting potato seed. Well, we tried it a few times, but I, I've never really seen a successful farmer, a native farmer. And I think it's so instilled in them that we have to go out. And that's why I keep pursuing these uh, harvesting areas, you know. We develop harvest areas uh, going up toward Revelstoke and uh, because our people have to follow it because they all grow at different levels, uh, you know, at different times when you go up higher. Mm -hmm. they, they, uh, some are a week apart, so they spend one week here harvesting one area, so they have to go to the next one. As, uh, one time I think I was driving through uh, Alberta border and there were some of our potatoes up there, and I think in early August. And here they start in late May. So the higher you go, the later it will grow. So that's why our people had to travel all over in the land to do the harvesting. Mm -hmm. They just followed the crops around. And uh, that's why a lot of, uh, from all over, right up, uh, I think 
Revelstoke is the last one that our people talked about, and that's right now. I'm talking to the ones up at the uh, parks, Revelstoke Park now. Mm -hmm. There's a big field of them up there. They're telling me, oh, it's okay, we got lots. <laughs> That's what we said about a lot of our plants and where did they go because nobody's looking after them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, like a garden. You have to look after it. You have to go there and harvest a little bit, keep tilling the soil to keep them going. Because I noticed that in the Sconless, we got a bunch of potatoes growing there. I went over there. One area there, there was a lot of them growing a few years ago. And I went over there, and now there's no more. So it's telling me that, uh, you know, they literally died out because nobody's looking after them anymore. And that's what I keep telling people, you know, the plants talk to me. They told me, they we're going to leave you if you don't need us anymore. And this is the message I keep giving to our people. The plants told me, we're going to leave you if you don't need us anymore. And uh, I strongly believe in that. Well, and you're working so hard towards sharing that knowledge and helping to reclaim that, the abilities. So can you tell us about the projects that you're working on right now? I know that there was um, some discussion about a pilot project with Agriculture Canada. Is, is that the one that you're um, talking about with Revelstoke? And no, uh, no. Uh, this is uh, Canada. They're out of uh, Summerland, mm. and uh, I don't think they really have a concept of how to work with our uh, with our people yet. Because uh, I don't think they grasp the the true meaning of why we want to do it. They're more interested in the scientific end. So I think we got our little, got to keep digging away at it and working at it. But uh, I think if we're persistent, I think uh, once the message gets out, I think to all the people, I think they'll <clears throat> understand what I'm talking about, you know, with, uh, getting back. Because I hear a lot of talk about we got to get back out in the land. And what other better way of getting out in the land and going out and harvesting? Yeah. How healthy it is, you know, you're up there, camped out there for a week at a time. And uh, think of the manual labor. That's why I wanted to till the soil. I figured out a, a way, a system of tilling the soil so it makes it easier for our people to go back and start harvesting again. Once they start tilling the soil, well, it, I think it'll be make it a lot easier for the next few generations to come to be able to go up there and start harvesting. Because we've lost a lot of our harvest areas and, uh, because of the competition, you know, the trees go back in. We found one up at, uh, up at uh, South Canoe. There was a few plants and I'd fill one up there for a walk and uh, already there was trees growing up, brush growing all over. So naturally they're not going to last very long up there. So our people must have had a way of... Uh, Maybe they're, you know, what they talk about uh, as, as, uh, the burning, mm -hmm. burning of the land to keep that harvest area going. Mm -hmm. So, because I could see a lot of it, competition taking over and that causes uh, some of our plants to disappear too. Right. So a lot of the traditional techniques to keep the land productive have been lost as well. Yeah. And that has to be reintroduced, so mm -hmm. and a lot of probably negotiations with the government about the, because we'd have talked to forestry, uh, if we discover traditional area going up toward Revelstoke, so it's going to be a lot of work involved in it, you know, from the political end. Right. You know, so negotiations, already talked with Canoe Forest Products and they have a lot of tenure up there and I've already approached them and so they're aware of what I'm doing. And I talked with uh, Parks Canada up at Revelstoke already, we're meeting with them whenever this code bit is gone. So, so is that I say a lot of work. 
Yeah, well, that's the thing. You must find it very challenging being that there's all of this private ownership, crown land, government things, licenses. Yeah. It must be yeah. overwhelming sometimes just to navigate that and to try to try to tell people this is our traditional harvesting land. <laughs> like, how do you how do you negotiate that? Yeah, well, that's going to be the fun part. <laughs> 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 we do have some on our own land already, but, uh, you know, we need more of it, you know, uh, like our people did a long time ago, because mm -hmm. we'd only be allowed to dig probably only one week in one area. Mm -hmm. And if we want it sustaining like we did a long time ago, we'd have to develop more harvest areas as we go up higher up. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And there's a lot of other plants that we haven't really touched on yet, our hibiscus cranberries, or you name it, you know. How do we develop those too? Yeah, those are long-term plants that need time and attention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, it, and they only grow best in their natural area or habitat or whatever you want to call it, you know. And uh, to me, uh, it's going to be challenging. That's why I'd like to see a research station set up down here mm. on our traditional plants. That's a great yeah. idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because there's a lot more because uh, what what food value does it? Because some of them you can, you know, they're dangerous to eat, but when you dry them or cook them, they, they're edible. Mm -hmm. And the medicinal the medicinal uh, quantity or qualities in there, it's a lot more healthier than people realize. Mm -hmm. uh, I think though, those got to be looked at. And does drying change uh, the, uh, what does the drying do? You know, the research has to be done in those. Mm -hmm. We got a couple of the uh, colleges uh, or the universities want to take some of our plants as with their uh, culinary arts. They want to play around with them in their cooking school. So there is an interest out there. Mm -hmm. But uh, how do we develop it into maybe a market uh, food? or And uh, that's going to be another one, too. The, we talked, we looked into, uh, what do they call that? Uh, the... the rights to own, mm. uh, copy, no, not copy, right? Uh, I know what you mean, like the, uh, like, um, yeah, I know what you mean, but I can't think of the word. It's, it's to prevent people from going out into an area and just uh, claiming it berries and, and claiming it. Right, and just selling jam or something, yeah. Yeah. So how do you manage the that? only way with our I think the only way with our tr traditional plants is that all the Swapman Nation have to get together and yeah. declare it. Uh, I'm thinking of the name. <laughs> we'll come but uh, anyways. And then I'd like to know like so how is it going to introduce these ideas and these skills to young people? Like are you finding that your young people are interested in coming out into the forest and harvesting with you? Yeah, they don't mind coming out for a couple of hours, that's all. And uh, we had them up in Mount Ida once, you know, they're all sitting on stumps with their little iPhones and <laughs> all of a sudden they realized they were outside. <laughs> they forgot about their iPhones and they started running around. So there is hope for them. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to hear. <laughs> but you know, uh, I think it would, I think it would be, different. What I'd like to see is probably incorporate Swapman's language, you know, on these uh, trips, mm -hmm. you know, with the elders and the youth. They camp out there, make them camp out there for a week at a time to get, to be able to talk in Swapman and uh, induce a lot of the sweating the Swapman way. Yeah. You know, it would be really interesting to see what would come from it. Yeah. It's like immersion then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. School. Yeah. That's our old school out in the land. Yeah. The true, you know, true homeschooling. <laughs> yeah. Outside of home. 
Yeah, because you know, when you think about it, where did uh, they chase out the uh, our culture, residential school, and, and how did they do it? They brought you into the classroom. And they told you not to speak your language, or you know, you're punished. They turned around. And they put us into another school, not a residential school, but in another school classroom. So that stigma is still there. You know, I'm not learning our culture. Mm -hmm. So basically, the I hate to say it, but the the, uh, the school we have now is just an extension of the residential school because they don't really teach our culture to to our people, you know, and not a challenge in itself. Because, you know, we were always an oral history and nothing was written down, so. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's, well, it, I think your, you're, um, like your points are so strong. They're so important to make because the structure of school right now is, is really artificial. And, and even for, the settler culture. And so being able to um, say no to that kind of structure and instead reintroduce the ideas and the ways, the processes that your traditional, uh, like your ancestors taught your youth, it seems to me that that would be a natural step to reintroducing the knowledge. Um, but that just doesn't seem to be uh, you know, possible right now, right? Like the capacity for a lot of bands is it's, they're trying, they're trying to set up systems and schools. It's just so hard right now, just because of the way that the, uh, you know, colonial structure has been set up. Well, they don't set up hunting and gathering uh, workshops anymore. <laughs> I think that's part of it, you know, because yeah. uh, our ways of change, you know, it's totally different, but there could be some of it brought back, you know, to our people. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, to me, it's that eating of our culture, learning our culture again, who we are as Swatma. As a Swatma. Yeah. I think to me, that's the most important part. So you, you have know. hope. Yeah. You do. So even if we can't, even if uh, you're not able to bring back all the elements of your ancestors' way of life, at least bringing back the food culture, the ability to uh, harvest traditional foods, all of those things like that, would that be, like, would, am I correct in saying that that's a, a priority of yours? Yeah, it's a, uh, I have a lot of priorities, I think, and uh, <clears throat> mostly, like my motto is, I'll work with you if you'll work with me. And uh, I find a lot of people that uh, are willing to share and and uh, and help in any way they can, you know. And to me, that uh, you know, they call it truth and reconciliation. Now, to me, I just call it working together, you know, to make this a better place, because that's what's missing, you know, because. Uh, People relied on our people when they first moved here for some of the food and to live on her, learn how to live and live off the land. Because there were stories of my grandmother was telling us, you know, the uh, Finnish people up on the, up on the Glen Eden bench used to come down and trade. They bring their sugar, tea, uh, coffee, what our people did. Uh, they brought it down and they traded with them, you know, for smoked salmon. Uh, near our meat and uh, some of the vegetables. So they relied on each other to survive. Mm -hmm. But once uh, the other things took over, they just put us aside, you know, well, we don't need you anymore, attitude kind of. And uh, so we just eventually learned how to emulate the uh, the Sema, we call them, the white men. Learn how to hunt and gather in the grocery stores. <laughs> yeah. And I, I do feel like there's so much to learn that people 
that live in the Shiswap that are now on Sahuatmec land. There's so much to learn from you about how we can connect with the land and how we can work with the land towards sustainability. So I really want to, yeah, I want to say that there's a lot of people really happy to work with you, Louie, about this. Yeah. 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 And I'm willing to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today. I hope we have other chances to talk about all of your other priorities. Because <laughs> yeah. I know have a lot. And <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much.